city in Manhattan, uh, practicing physical medicine rehabilitation, specializing in pain and sports medicine. Um, I'm part of New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is a very large health system here in New York City. Uh, we cover about 11 hospitals, all the boroughs involved, and run a pretty large clinical enterprise with med students, both at Columbia and Cornell, um, and also many, many clinic sites where we kind of treat a whole bunch of variety of conditions, which I will explain to you. So let me just tell you a little bit about physiatry. Uh, so physiatry is physical medicine rehabilitation. It comes from two words, physicos, physical, and iatria, which is the art of healing. And the specialty kind of gained traction after the World War I and World War II, when a lot of injured soldiers were coming back from the United States, uh, many suffering from brain injuries and amputees, and those patients needed someone to take care of them. And prior to that, it was primarily physical therapists uh, caring for these patients. But then out of that, this specialty really started developing. And since its inception in 1947 to now, uh, the scope of what we do has changed tremendously, and I'm definitely going to get into that in a moment. Um, so what are we and what are we not? Uh, physiatrists are medical physicians, either MDs or DOs. Um, we diagnose a whole host of conditions. Uh, I specialize in sports and spine, um, but there are, like I said, brain injury specialists, pediatric, women's health, pelvic floor, um, many, many different iterations of physiatry all located throughout the U.S. We cover both inpatient so if a patient has suffered from a spinal cord injury or a brain injury, or even let's say they've had knee replacement surgery and they need some aggressive rehabilitation and physical therapy, they'll come to our acute inpatient center and we'll treat them for a few weeks until they're ready to kind of get reintroduced to the community. Um, and then certainly on the outpatient side, when we see patients in clinic, um, again, from pain and sports, we see weekend warriors, we see professional athletes, um, anyone who has any musculoskeletal complaint, we treat those patients. Uh, the training in the United States uh, consists of, uh, after four years of medical school, uh, there are 78 residency programs that are accredited, which is a four-year program. Uh, one year is usually a transitional year, either internal medicine or surgery, um, and then followed three years of physical medicine training. After that, you can pursue a fellowship. There's a whole bunch of different fellowships, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I did two fellowships. Uh, one in pain medicine and one in sports medicine. You know, maybe I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do both. So I, I chose both of those. Uh, but pediatric rehab is gaining a lot of popularity, popularity and they treat patients with uh, cerebral palsy or genetic disorders from birth. Uh, traumatic brain injury inc includes those who had a trauma, either in a car accident or some type of work-related injury, um, but also older people who had a stroke, even younger people who had a stroke. Um, so any type of brain injury that's acquired or traumatic um, is treated by those specialists. Uh, so what do we normally do in a day-to-day -day practice? And our kind of thesis and motto is regaining a patient's function and improving their quality of life so they can kind of go back to doing what they want to do. And we do that in a very integrated fashion. Uh, physiatrists never work alone. We work very closely with other team members, which in could include orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons. It could include physical therapists, uh, OBGYN, especially, you know, we have a couple of docs in my department that specialize in women's health and pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so prenatal and postnatal, there are complications sometimes with musculoskeletal conditions or pelvic floor problems. So they work very, very closely with those providers as well. Um, and we are non-surgeons. I think Davina mentioned that I'm a spine surgeon. I do micro minimally invasive surgeries, but the big spine surgeries, I leave to the spine surgeon. So we primarily specialize in the non-surgical management of pain. Um, like I mentioned before, it is multidisciplinary, multi-specialty. We integrate well with rheumatologists and neuroscience. You know, I heard a lot of, a few of you mentioned uh, being out of Dallas. I actually was just on a call at UT Southwestern yesterday uh, speaking with the head of the neuroscience department there at the O'Donnell Brain Institute. Uh, and what's beautiful about an institute like that is there are neurosurgeons, neurologists, neuroscience specialists, physical therapists, rehab doctors, everyone working together to get patients better. So that's kind of what we believe in physiatry. Some of the conditions that we treat, uh, sports-related injuries, carpal tunnel. I'm currently wearing a wrist brace right now, suffering from golfer's elbow. Uh, so a lot of different things where patients come in the door complaining of certain things and we try to get them back to functioning, whether it's 
taking care of their grandkids or participating in weekend warrior sports. Or like myself, I pretend to think I'm a golfer or a tennis player. So whatever I need to get back to living a quality of life and engaging in some type of recreation is, is kind of our goal. Uh, on the neurologic side, uh, spinal cord injury, stroke, multiple sclerosis, neuropathies, movement disorders, Parkinson's, things that you may have heard of. Um, these are conditions that the neurologic rehab specialists focus on. And again, getting them back to functioning at a high level. So I want to talk about a quick case just to kind of highlight what we do, who we treat, and how we kind of get patients back to their level of function. Uh, so we have a 44-year-old male electrician. Uh, he was bending to lift a chandelier overhead. Uh, felt immediately lower back pain, no radiation into the legs, neurologic exam was normal. And why the, why the second two things are important is when you think of radiation of the legs, you think of some type of nerve being compressed in the spine and the neurologic exam being normal is relevant because there's no nerve damage. If the patient had weakness or numbness or reflex changes, you're gonna get a little more concerned and you might order some advanced imaging to look at the spine. Uh, but in this patient, that exam was normal, which gave us a little bit more time to figure out where the pain's coming from. The most important part of my job is to figure out this pain generator. And in the spine, there are so many, so many pain generators living in close proximity to one another. Um, it could be the periosteum, which is the bone. In the spine, you have vertebral bodies, which are the bones that keep us upright. And in between these bones, you have something called intervertebral discs. Think of those discs kind of like jelly donuts. There's a hard covering on the outside and jelly like in the middle. Sometimes the jelly in the middle will, will squirt out and that's called the disc herniation. And when that happens, that jelly can pinch a nerve and patients get shooting pain down the leg, something called sciatica. You might have a family member or even you yourself had suffered from this before. Um, but in this patient that he did not have radiating symptoms into the leg. Behind the disc are the facet joints. Uh, these are like little knuckle joints. If you look at your fingers, a little knuckle here, there's a whole bunch of them on each side of the spine and they can develop arthritis. Usually we see this in the older adults, you know, 50, 60, 70. Uh, that being said, in gymnasts, you know, the Olympics are happening right now. So when gymnasts are doing a lot of back bend or tumbling, we can see them stress those joints because they're doing a lot of extension based maneuvers. Um, and then the sacroiliac joint is a common joint that comes up. This joint is where the sacrum, which is the bottom of the spine, connects to the hip bone. In women, more so than men, that joint can get disrupted just because of the way the pelvis is shaped. Women tend to have a wider pelvis, men tend to have a longer pelvis. Uh, so especially in pregnancy, you know, when you're about to ha give birth, the pelvis has to accommodate the delivery um, through the pelvic cavity. And sometimes that sacroiliac joint can get affected. So the most important thing is figuring out the diagnosis. Once you do that, you can figure out the best treatment plan, which can be predictable leading to the best outcomes. And that's what I think what we really spe specialize in, uh, in, in physical medicine rehabilitation. One of the, the things that I'm interested in is core strengthening. Uh, you know, when, when a patient comes to me with the case that I mentioned before, yes, we could do a bunch of things. We can give them medications and injections and interventions. Stem cells is something that I do on a research side, but really core strengthening is the hallmark of treating these back pain patients. You know, all of us sitting on the Zoom right now, right now we're sitting, for, for the most part we're sitting. And when that happens, you're putting a lot of pressure on that disc, that jelly donut that I mentioned previously, you're kind of squeezing that disc which is why if you ever sat for a long period of time, your back kind of gets stiff. You need to stand up and lean back and de decompress the spine. So in order to strengthen the core, what that does is it takes pressure off all those elements of the spine that I mentioned before, like the bones, the joints, and the ligaments. The most common core muscle that we can think of is the rectus abdominis, right? This is the quote six pack muscle. This is the muscle that we all try to develop. So, you know, in our physique, so it looks nice. And what does that rectus abdominis muscle do? It flexes the spine. You can see the fibers going up and down, vertically oriented. So when they contract, you flex the spine. So in thinking that this muscle flexes the spine, we started to do sit-ups, you know, 50, 60 years ago, they created all these different equipment, whether it was the ab roller or these benches or this crazy contraption over here. Basically all these devices used to flex the spine. The thinking was if you strengthen that six pack muscle, your core is gonna get stronger and that's a good solution for functionality. What we kind of know is that that's not true. And if you think about the, if you think about the sit up specifically to do a really good sit up, high quality sit up, you could do about 20 to 30 per minute. 
uh, you can burn four to five calories per minute of sit-ups. So you think about a pound, uh, which is 3,500 calories, it'll take you 26,000 sit-ups to lose one pound. So that being said, you automatically know this is probably not a great way to lose weight. And the more you see it in spine care and in gyms, a lot of them are moving away from sit-ups. You know, we're doing more planks, uh, we're doing other exercises, but the sit-ups are kind of falling by the wayside. This was a really interesting study done in 1960s, Dr. Nakamson, and basically what he did, he put small electrodes into the discs of his medical students, his third year medical students, he put small electrodes into the disc and measured them at certain maneuvers. So if you think about them way over here in the lower left, lying on their back, that was about 25% of the force into the disc, whereas standing, which is right here, is 100%. So think about all the other things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We bend forward, we pick up the trash, we might pick up our dog or pick up a kid. We sit on a computer all day. And when you sit on a computer, you're putting between two and three times the force on your disc. So you can imagine those desk workers and you know people who work in banking and finance, uh, sometimes they sit all day and they end up with these disc issues because you're squeezing the, the nutrients out of the disc. But the core is made up of more than just the rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle. And really it's these deeper muscles that play a role in core strengthening. And those muscles include the external oblique, which are horizontally oriented fibers that help you with lateral bending, the internal oblique, which is just deep to that, uh, which helps you with respiration, uh, also kind of longitudinally oriented. But the most important muscle, which no one really talks about is the transversus abdominis. This is the deepest, deepest core muscle and we call it nature's waist belt. The reason we do that is if you have a strong transverse abdominus, you're gonna take all the pressure off your spine, uh, the discs, the joints, the ligaments, and you're probably gonna suffer less from back pain on a regular basis. And the way to kind of envision engaging that muscle is even while you're, while you're sitting here listening to me on the Zoom, imagine you're about to get punched in the stomach. Like that sensation where you kind of engage your core, suck your belly button to your spine. That's your deep transverse abdominus muscle working. And that's a practice you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. You can do it from walking from one class to the other while you're sitting on a chair, just engage that deep core muscle. Uh, and you'll notice you'll probably feel less back pain in the long term, and it'll just protect you from deterioration going forward. <clears throat> this was an interesting study that we did looking at the different muscles activated doing different core exercises. So if you look at sit-ups, you're getting a lot of activity from the external oblique and the rectus abdominis. But this orange here, with your, which is your transverse abdominus, remember I said that's the most important muscle, is not getting much activity. So there you have it again, doing a sit-up is not really going to be beneficial for engaging that deep core muscle, which is the most important. Curl up, which is kind of like a sit-up, but you're not going all the way up. Again, pretty low external, internal transverse abdominus activity, very high rectus activity, which is why, again, those initial exercises that came out focused on sit-ups. Well, we know six pack is just for show. You know, no one with a six pack necessarily has a strong core and vice versa. If you don't have a six pack, that doesn't mean you don't have a strong core. So the rectus abdominis is kind of useless in that sense of core stability. Uh, really it's for aesthetics more than anything else. Leg raises, same thing, very high rectus abdominis activation and psoas. Psoas is another muscle that is a hip flexor. So if you think about soccer players where they're kicking the ball, uh, especially, you know, now that's pretty relevant going on with the Euro Cup. It's the psoas muscle that's really, really activated during leg raises. Again, not much activation of your deep core muscles. The exercise that does engage your transverse is side support. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And basically that's a side plank. You know, probably 10, 15 years ago, no one really heard of side planks. You know, we did some planks, some sit-ups, some crunches and leg raises, but side support has really come up after these biomechanical studies because they show how much you engage that transverse abdominus muscle. So when you look at Stuart McGill and Stuart McGill is based out of Montreal um, and he talks about the best way to engage your deep transverse abdominus muscle and protect your spine. And these are the big three exercises that come up. And these are the ones that I start my patients off on. So one is the curl up uh, where you're kind of just engaging your core and not sitting up entirely. Number two is the bird dog. You're on all fours and you do one leg and the opposite arm and you're engaging the entire lower back muscles from your head all the way to your tail. So these are your extensors. And the third one that I mentioned, side bridge or side support. So again, this is a really good way to engage your transverse abdominus muscle. Um, so one last thing, you know, I, I started a podcast uh, 
two summers ago, kind of talking about health and wellness topics. And it was more for education, you know, just giving people like you, patients, uh, pe people's family members, education on different in the health and wellness topics. Um, the one that came out today was on women's health in, in cardiology, um, why women sometimes are more prone to getting a cardiac event and not knowing about it. Uh, so a resource for you, a resource for anyone you want, just to kind of have a reference of, uh, of health and wellness topics. And, you know, I, I show this picture because, you know, we talk about core and core is not just about six pack. Uh, core is about strength. Uh, and you can be very, very strong in your core by exercising with the ways I mentioned. Um, or vice versa, you can be very, very thin, have a six pack and not have a strong core. So it's exercising that's most important. It's not really the appearance superficially. All right. I buzzed through that. You know, I just want to give you guys a little touch of what we do in physiatry and the kind of patients that we see. Uh, but again, I am here for you guys to ask questions about anything, medicine, physiatry, or et cetera. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or you can raise your hand on Zoom too. And then Dr. Sin Singh will either call on you or I can read out some questions that you guys have in the chat. But so far, I think we just have some chat questions. So if you'd like to go ahead and answer them. Sure, so someone asked me about my undergrad. So I did my undergraduate in Washington, DC at George Washington University. Uh, I was there for undergraduate and medical school. Uh, and after that, I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to do my residency training. Uh, following that, I went to Colorado for two years to do sports and pain fellowship. Um, and then I came back to Cornell in 2011, where I've been since then. And it's been a pretty exciting journey. You know, when I, when I first got to New York City, my department is very small. We had four faculty members, and now we've grown to 22. Um, just kind of says the amount of exposure that we have created in the market here and how many patients need help with sports and spine and musculoskeletal conditions. Um, so that's where I've been. Uh, someone asked approximately how many hours do you work per day and do you have a lot of on-call work? So I think it's it's case by case dependent. And when I first got here, you know, my job was to build a practice. So yeah, I worked a lot. I worked, you know, 7A to 7P, five days a week. I did not have kids at the time. And my goal was to build a reputation and, and build a practice. Um, since becoming vice chair two years ago, my clinical volume has gone down because I'm more responsible for the rest of the faculty. Uh, so I'm in clinic two and a half days a week and administrative two and a half days a week uh, where I kind of oversee all the operations. It's less clinic work, but it's still work. Um, you know, a lot of patients, a lot of people go into physical medicine, rehabilitation, physiatry because of lifestyle. You know, we understand the importance of spending time with your families, being physically fit and physically active. We want to represent uh, ourselves to the patient. Um, so we have really good work-life balance. I mean, you can work as hard as you want and make a lot more money. You can work as little as you want to make less money, but it's really individualized. And I think for me living in Manhattan, I have two kids now. I don't know if you guys heard them screaming a little while ago, uh, but I think it's a good work-life balance. All right. Why did you choose this career? You know, I actually wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, when I was in high school, we used to rotate, um, the last three months of high school, we didn't go to school. We actually took all of our finals in March and we spent time in any industry that we wanted. And I spent time with an orthopedic surgeon. So that's what I thought I wanted to do. Uh, and after I did medical school, I actually did surgery for two years. And I liked surgery, it was fun, uh, but really I found myself drawn to the clinic. I, I really struggled with the patients that we'd operate on. We do a knee replacement or in a child, we'd fix an elbow. And then I would never see the patients again. And you know, I'd see them in the clinic two weeks later for a wound check. and. I really wouldn't know, are they playing sports again? Are they functioning? So I was really drawn to clinic and seeing where they were in long-term. And that's when I made the transition. Uh, you know, I, then I pursued a physiatry residency and never looked back. You know, my, my chairman at the time said, you know, would you be happy not operating? And I didn't really understand what he meant. I was like, yeah, I love operating, it's fun. But he's like, no, but the question is, would you be happy not operating? And I answered, yeah, I mean, it's fun. I'd like to do surgery, but I would be happy not operating too. I love seeing clinic. And he said, you know, if that's the case, then really think about physiatry because surgeons, you know, they're cut from a different cloth. And if they're not operating, they're not happy people. Um, and you, they want to operate. And I was like, that wasn't really me. So I made that transition and it's been, uh, you know, a blessing since then. I'm just trying to go through some of these questions. Um, looks like we have a hand raised. Okay. Um, uh, Fatima, do you want to ask a question? 
Uh, sure. So my question was kind of specific, um, just because you mentioned um, that it was a multi-special specialty um, or multi-speciality specialty. Um, and you mentioned that you um, constantly work alongside um, other specialties like rheumatology, for example. Yep. So I've personally worked or shadowed a rheumatologist in a clinic before. So I just wanted to know from your um, perspective, like I'll, I'll give you a situational question. Um, sure. How would you... Um, I think you cut out for um, a second. Oh, so from your perspective, how would you personally um, treat someone with polymyalgia, for example, versus how a rheumatologist would recommend they get treated? Yeah, you know, I think you know that's that's a not an easy condition to treat anyway. Usually, it's a condition after they've gone through many many physicians for trying to figure out what's happening. Um, I think the treatment's going to be similar. You know, the biggest difference from us and rheumatology is, you know, I think rheumatologists have a better skill set of understanding the blood work and the labs involved, especially in autoimmune diseases, um, where some physiatrists who have an interest in that could pursue that. For me personally, I don't know as much about it, which is why I partner with rheumatologists. But once that condition and diagnosis is made, which usually is a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, the treatment's kind of parallel with, you know, some type of anti-inflammatory, whether it's a low dose steroid, oral steroid for a prolonged period of time. Uh, now they have some immune modulating medications that can be helpful. But once it comes to that discussion, where it's more medicine based, then I usually partner with rheumatology. You know, I'm, I know my value is most more in the interventions and in the rehabilitation component. Uh, but what is, once it's medical management, then I do defer to my room colleagues. So you would say that um, a rheumatologist would be best for diagnosing and prescribing um, medication, and you would be more for like the physical treatment. Especially for that condition, for PMR. You know, usually for osteoarthritis or other type of myalgias, I think we we cover a fair amount of that. But for PMR, I think it's definitely rheumatology. Okay. Thank you so much for answering. I see a few other hands up. Alyssa? Hi. So my question is, um, how would you balance your work life and your personal life in the medical field? Yeah, I think that's a, always a work in progress. Um, when I first came to New York, like I said, I, I was married with no kids. And I think I really prioritized work. Um, my, my goal was to create a reputation and create a clinical practice. And my wife kind of knew that going into this. And now with kids, I had a couple options. Either I could continue on the same path and maybe be a little bit better financially, uh, but at what cost was my answer. You know, my, my father is a physician and he came from India. So I know his priority was to make money. That was the priority, you know, that was his goal. And I didn't get to see him as much growing up. And I said, I don't want to be like that. So I made a balance. I said, I can work more years and just work a little bit less now. I take my son to school every morning. I walk him to school. I pick them up most days of the week. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit of a sacrifice, but I made that a, I made that decision for myself um, because I knew how important it was. And these years are limited. You know, these kids are going to be kids for only a short period of time. And I didn't want to look back and saying I should have worked less. Thank you. And, and, and in physiatry, you have that luxury. You know, sometimes in the surgical specialties, you don't. Cases go when they go and sometimes they run late and it's very unpredictable. I like to say I have pretty good control over my schedule. You know, I create my clinic schedule. I create my my meeting schedule. Um, there's always something that comes up, you know, off the books, but it's very, very rare. And um, I think I, I think we do a pretty good job of balancing that. All right, Daniel Fry. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were doing some research involving stem cells on the side. Uh, do mm -hmm. you mind me asking what's what it's about specifically, like? The specifics of it? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't like to use, I use the word stem cell very loosely. You know, we want to be a, a lot more scientific about it. So really it's stem cell based treatments or growth factor treatments. So the most common things that come up that you may have seen in, in the media, uh, social media or the news is something called platelet rich plasma, PRP. And basically, you know, we all have stem cells floating around in our body. You know, when we cut ourselves, our body will send 
mesenchymal stem cells to that location or ones that are already physically there to turn them on to start the repair process. When we fracture a bone, the same thing there, the native stem cells that live there will turn around and turn on and start producing more bone um, to, to, to heal that fracture. So PRP basically takes someone's peripheral blood, spins it down, gets all the growth factors, concentrates them and puts them in certain locations. And, and the, the research on this has been 20 something years, um, starting with tennis elbow, like I said, I'm suffering from tennis elbow right now, um, to things like Achilles tendinopathy. And now we've gone into the disc and into the spine. So my research does a little bit with PRP, platelet-rich plasma, um, but what I focus on is something called bone marrow derived stem cells. Uh, in the bone marrow, we have very, very high quality stem cell that we can extract by going into the bone with a small drill, taking out the cells, centrifuging them, characterizing them, and then injecting them back into certain places, whether it's a joint, hip, knee, shoulder for arthritis, uh, or into the disc, which is where my clinical research focuses. Um, sorry, Good just question. building on that. Um, so you would attempt to treat some of the more persistent issues like severe nerve damage or something with the stem cells, right? Yeah, Is that so, the end goal? Yeah, certainly it's not in the algorithm. If you look at a condition, let's, let's say knee arthritis, very, very common condition, especially in the older adult. The first things are weight loss, stop smoking, maybe an anti-inflammatory, maybe bracing, physical therapy. If that doesn't work, then we talk about injections. Sometimes cortisone injections, steroid injections can help with knee arthritis, but we know that steroids actually degrade the cartilage of the knee, so we try to avoid that. But then there's other, inter other gel type injections that we can offer, something called hyaluronic acid, uh, which is essentially just a collagen, uh, you know, derm and plastics use it for fillers, hip fillers and cosmetic, that's hyaluronic acid. And if those don't work or provide short-term relief, then we get a little more interventional and that's where I'll start talking to the patient about these bone marrow derived or other derived stem cell options. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely not the first go-to. You know, the other challenge is we're still researching it. I'm still studying it. Insurance doesn't pay for it. So sometimes there's out of pocket. Luckily for me, I've been given a large grant that covers most of the costs so I can really study it properly. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely not the, the first treatment in, uh, in this condition. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Sure. Uh, James Lynn, I saw your hand up. Right. So earlier you mentioned how you balance work with your family life, right? I was curious if you've ever gone through periods of like long distance in terms of relationships. And if so, how do you balance your rigorous like work schedule with long distance relationships? Yeah. Um, so my wife and I were long distance for seven years, not while we were married, but while we were engaged and together. Uh, you know, she was in New York this entire time. Like I mentioned, I spent some time in DC, some time in Philadelphia and some time in Denver. Uh, so we were long distance pretty much that entire time. You know, when I was in DC and Philadelphia, getting to New York was pretty easy. You could take the bus or the train. In Denver, it was a little more challenging, but it gave her an excuse to come visit me. Uh, but then when I moved back to New York, that's when we got married. That's when we started having kids. So we were never long distance after marriage. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy, but I think, you know, you know certainly credit to her of dealing and being patient with medical training. You know, there's medical school, there's residency, there's a lot of years with a lot of work and no money. Um, so maybe she was using me as an investment, who knows? Uh, but I think, you know, her, her patience certainly helped. She was supportive in that. And I think that's the most important, managing expectations, knowing that this is a long road. You know, most of our colleagues who end up getting jobs straight out of undergrad at 22, and where your first paycheck is not, you know, sometimes for 10 years after that is not easy to swallow. But I mean, that's why we chose this specialty because, you know, we saw passion and desire in it. And I think finding a partner uh, that supports that and understand that is the most important thing. Otherwise, you know, divorce rate is high. The divorce rate is high anyway, but especially in really challenging specialties like spine surgery and orthopedics and things like that, you know, divorce rate could be 70, 80%. So really be mindful of who you select as a partner and be thoughtful of their, their needs as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Zoha Yusuf. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that in your research, you work with the PRP and you mentioned how steroid injections that are given to rheumatoid arthritis patients degrade the cartilage. So uh, there's been like a recent rise in the use of biological treatments 
like Symphony, and I think there's a, another called Humera. Uh, how, how would you say is different from the regular steroid injections? Is that better or worse? Yeah, so I mean, steroids we know based on the biomechanical models, they do degrade cartilage, they do interfere with muscle rehab. So we try to avoid them. Now, I mean, there are patients that swear by it. You know, we, they come in once a year and they say, I need my steroid injection into the knee. It keeps me functional. I'm going to a wedding. I can put my grandkids and, you know, there's a cost benefit analysis here. I want the patients to be functional. And if this injection can keep them functional and off oral opioids and narcotics, then I still use it. Despite what the science says about cartilage degradation, um, there is still a case for, for using that. In terms of some of these uh, disease modifying agents like Humira and things like that, you know, that's more for an immune modulated arthritis. Um, and those aren't benign either. You know, those have some systemic adverse events. Uh, at least with cortisone, there is a local application. You know, it's very little in the systemic system. You do see a little bit of a rise in blood sugar, but most of the medication stays within the joint. So, I mean, that's a perfect example. I, you know, I treated a patient with sacroiliac joint pain. She did very well with the steroid injection and the pain came back and I was very reluctant to do it again. She was a young woman. Um, I said, let's, let's partner with Room and see what they think. And, you know, she ended up having sacroiliitis um, and having a positive ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. So there was some question of, is this lupus or is there some type of uh, anti autoimmune system? So. Uh, she was put on one of these medications you mentioned, one of these DMARDs, and is doing much better. So, you know, it's, that's uh, that's why we have to partner with other individuals, other specialists, you know, ortho, room, neurology, to really help us with the diagnosis sometimes. Thank you so much for answering. Sure. Um, I see who's next. And I don't, I don't know who's next. Uh, I have a Gajung next. Yes. Um, hello. Can I ask you about your medical application experience and any tips for that? Um, I was fortunate when I went to GW for undergrad there. You said medical school, right? Yes, sir. Um, uh, they had an early selection program. Uh, so they did have a seven year medical program straight out of undergrad, uh, but then also an eight year program when you were a second year in, in undergrad. Uh, so I applied for that and I was fortunate to get in. I still applied and took the MCAT just to see where else I would have gotten in. Uh -huh. Yeah, medical school, it's a, it was a stressful process, at least back then. Who knows what it is like now? I don't even know what the MCAT's out of these days. You know, back then it was out of 35 or 36. Um, but I think the process was to really show on the application why you, why you should be selected for a career in medicine. Um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, the personal statement and volunteer work, a lot of extracurriculars. At this point, you know, I'm imagining most of the 400 people on this panel have good grades and probably are great at taking tests. Uh, so what's going to separate you is sometimes relationships, who you have met with along the way and who can give you a good letter, uh, but also just showing that passion of why medicine, especially, you know, the landscape of medicine has changed significantly in just a short time of my leaving medical school, you know, 15, 20 years ago. I'm sure it's going to change a lot in the next 20 years as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Nadia Khan. Hi, yeah, okay, on a similar note, uh, I was wondering what kind of like extracurriculars or involvement or like job experiences helped you with getting in and then also how like you were able to gain access to those sort of like resources or jobs. Yeah, I don't think there's uh, you know, one size fits all. Uh, you know, a lot of student applications did so many incredible things. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I did at GW was uh, get some exposure in a lab. Uh, so I ended up working in a hookworm lab, uh, looking at a certain bacteria. Don't even ask me what it is now because it was 20 years ago. And finding the concentration of hookworm from dog feces. Uh, so I did that for two years. Uh, so every day I went to the lab and scooped up dog poop and found worms, counted them and track the concentration of a certain enzyme that was expelled from the hookworm and is part of the tropical medicine program. I don't know if that was the game changer of, of me getting into med school, uh, but it certainly gave me exposure into the medical school. Uh, so I was very fortunate to meet the professor of microbiology 
I don't know if you've seen the news the last year. There's a gentleman, Dr. Peter Hotez, who's in Texas now. He was actually my PI at GW before all that. So every time I see him on TV, I tell my wife, you know, this is the guy I worked with in undergrad. Uh, so that was one thing. And the second thing was kind of volunteering at the hospital. Um, you know, as an undergrad, you end up having some time. You know, you, I, I go, I went like, you know, eight hours a week, a couple hours here and there and just help with transport, helped with whatever they needed help with in the hospital. They can always use help. Um, and I think just, again, that just gave me exposure into the medical school and some of the leadership there. Uh, a lot of schools have undergraduate groups. Um, I forget what mine was called at GW. I want to say AMSA, but I can't remember now, Medical Student Association, something like that. Um, and that's where the deans and some of the professors from the med school come in and give you talks and you get to know who they are. And sometimes that does end up making a difference. All right, some Shrita. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your um, amazing lecture. I learned a lot about um, how to prevent back pain, um, especially okay. because uh, my dad himself, he suffered with uh, sciatica and back nerve, uh, back pain, sorry, uh, problems um, when I was younger. And so it was really nice to see like how exactly like uh, these problems can arise and how we can like fix it ourselves by uh, incorporating like a uh, good lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. And um, my question for you is, I know you already talked about having like passion and uh, the drive to pursue uh, the down the uh, uh, pre-med path because it is a very long one, takes about anywhere between eight to 10 years depending on your specialty and stuff. So what character strengths uh, would you say are like beneficial um, going down the road if you're interested in pursuing a, a career in the field of medicine? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is perseverance and figuring out why you want to do this. Uh, you know, a lot of people, especially my first and second year of med school, went into medicine because their parents said you have to be a doctor. Uh, and some end up making it through all four years of uh, medical trainings and a lot, a lot didn't. And it's because the road to medicine is very, very hard. There are a lot of pit stops and roadblocks along the way. And sometimes you have to pivot and call an audible and see if there's another path that's open. So I think, you know, persevering and just knowing that there are gonna be some failures along the way, no one gets it done completely easy without um, having to kind of change their game plan. So being a little bit nimble um, in that career pursuit is also very important. Well, and having support, you know, someone else mentioned about, you know, having support from your partner. I think, yeah, that's important. You know, you guys are pretty young, but some of you may have partners or thinking about it. And that's going to be a big part of who you end up with, just managing their expectations and saying, sorry, I'm not going to have money for a while. But hopefully after that, I'll have some money, a little bit more, and then uh, we can pay for stuff. And it's, it's delayed satisfaction. Um, you know, not comparing yourself with others, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, that whole mentality in medicine, that's, that's not going to be helpful. Um, and even after your training, I can attest it's not helpful. You know, I, I know the docs that try to keep up with the Joneses, they're not happy. They're working themselves to death and they don't have that work-life balance that I think is so important. Um, and I would like to add one more question to that. Um, were there any days in your career where you were like, it was a very emotionally demanding day? Like there was uh, maybe a negative instance with a patient that didn't end well and, uh, there were emotional consequences. Yeah, I think I think that happens all the time. You know, um, for me, I'm I'm pretty fortunate. You know, I love my I love most of my patients. You know, there are some patients I see them on the schedule, and I'm like, ugh, not again. But it happens. That's going to be at any practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, now you know, with administration, administrative work, uh, with research, I mean, there are days where I just look at my whiteboard in front of my desk and I get overwhelmed. And uh, good thing I have really great mentors here at the institution that kind of tell me to take a step back and, you know, refocus on what my priorities are and don't take on too much. You know, as a junior person, it's very difficult to say no when your chairman or when your vice chair asks you to do something, you automatically always say yes. And I, take, I think it takes a level of maturity to actually say, you know what, I would love to do that. But I just can't take on that much on my plate right now, especially when I have all this other stuff. So certainly there have been days where I'm overwhelmed. I have paper deadlines and research grant proposals. I look at my schedule, I have 35 patients tomorrow. I need to prep, prep for all the mini surgeries I have to do. I got to pick up my kid from ballet class. Wife's yelling at me because I'm late. Yeah, and that's life, it, it, it happens. But I think really just trying to figure out a way to balance that and 
make sure you're doing it for the right reasons is the most important. Thank you. Sure. Uh, all right, Sonia, I think Sonia's hand was up for a while. Hi. So given what you do, I just had a question um, in terms of your career path. What are your thoughts on working with sports teams directly, uh, you know, in terms of physiotherapy, sports medicine, right mm -hmm. after med school? Like, do you think that's possible to do or do you think I need some kind of experience before I could do that? Um, I think your involvement in, in a sports teams without either therapy training or part of some formal internship is going to be mostly observational. Um, I don't think it's bad necessarily because then you can see all the team members of the sports team medical crew working together. You know, when you, when you think about who, who, when you watch a sporting event and you see the people run out onto the field, first and foremost, it's the athletic trainer. They're the ones always out there first assessing the patient. Slowly after that, you'll see the medical team come in, uh, which could be the orthopedic surgeon, could be the physiatrist. You know, I used to cover the New York Knicks here and, and the Giants. I still cover every once in a while. And really, you're on the sidelines a lot. You're kind of just waiting for the trainer to call you over to help with a neuro evaluation or if it's a dislocated joint to help you kind of relocate a joint. So you really see the different stakeholders and the members of a sports team. So to answer your question, I don't think it would hurt you. Um, in fact, if you partner with the right teams and you see who those team docs are and they could help you get to the next level, whether it's through, you know, PT school or is it medical school? Um, I think relationship leverage, leveraging relationships is very, very important. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of people in undergrad don't get that exposure and don't get that training. The focus is on grades and uh, and standardized exams, which don't quite, don't get don't get me wrong, that is very important. Uh, but being human and and making relationships is also very important. So, uh, I think you'll learn a lot, and you'll learn what you want to do. That might save you a lot of time. You know, you might have gone in saying, "I need to be a doctor," or "I need to be an orthopedic spine surgeon or sports surgeon," and you might leave saying, "You know what? I don't want to do any of that. I want to be physical therapy. I would like to be an athletic trainer." And you know, that might save you time and increase your job satisfaction in the long term. All right, so we have time for one more question, Dr. Singh. Okay. Uh, all right, I see two people. Let's, let's ask these last two and then we'll go. So Iris, and I don't want to butcher your name, Iwaulua. All right, I want you to ask and then we can close it up. Okay, uh, thank you first for your time. Um, I guess I'm at a position where I'm thinking about asking for letters of recommendation. Um, really in a position where I've been receiving a lot of help and I'm kind of caught between like how to continue asking for help and then receiving that help like graciously. Um, you know, like without expecting it, but like, how do you, um, you know, find that like express appreciation while also saying, but I also like really need you to write a letter of recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I, that's been my life the last couple of years. You know, a lot of the residents ask me for letters, especially to get them into pain fellowships. Um, so for me, as the writer, I've done two things. One, I've kind of capped how many letters I can write uh, because I know I would just get backed up on deadlines. Uh, the second thing is sometimes I ask the student or the resident in my case to help me with a letter. And what I actually tell them to do is to look at their CV, uh, look at their uh, all their extracurricular activities and kind of distill that into a couple paragraphs as though they're writing a letter about themselves first person. And then I sometimes use that as my template, which helps speed up the process. And that way, sometimes I don't miss things that the student or resident really wants me to write in their letter. And then I finish it off with some of my experiences with them, some things that I typically say, depending on who the student is, about the level of my recommendation, my desire for them to stay with me or go to a different program. So that might be an option. You know, say you can always just, you know, drop a line, drop an email saying, hey, doctor, or whoever so and so, uh, just want to remind you of the letter if it helps. I'm happy to draft a first letter, first draft to share with you, and then you can finish it up, put it on your letterhead and send it in directly. And I'm sure most most uh, letter writers would not be upset with that. All right, good question. All right, last but not least. Hello, so I actually have two questions. My first oh, question dang, is- two questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. My first question is, um, as an undergraduate, do you think it's a good idea to shadow doctors from different specialties or shadow just different doctors with the same specialty? Yeah. I would say that as an undergrad, it's probably, you're not gonna get much value out of shadowing too many different doctors. You just don't know enough about medicine at that point and you're gonna change your mind so many times in medical school anyway. The benefit of shadowing a doctor is A, to pick the right doctor who can, again, create that relationship that could help you get into medical school. 
So find out who that person is. What are their credentials? Do they have any faculty appointments at a big institution? And can you leverage that relationship? I think that's more important. And then spend quality time with them. You know, if you spend a day or two days with 10 different doctors, A, the letters are going to be garbage. And when they go to the dean of admissions, they're not going to know who you are. So picking someone, any it doesn't really matter. I mean, it could be OBGYN, it could be pediatrics, it could be neurology, it doesn't matter. I would stick with one, again, someone who could help you and then spend a lot of time with them and, and learn from them. Either you'll love their specialty or you'll hate it. Either way, you're going to change your mind 10 times in medical school. So there's plenty of time. Thank you. And my second question was, I don't know if you're familiar with the PSMD program, but I wanted to ask if it was worth it. At GW? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of institutions have these combined uh, undergrad and medical programs. Uh, you know, the BSMD was the Bachelor of Science. Uh, so I had a lot of colleagues into it. I'm still, you know, my college roommate was in it. So I'm still very good friends with him. I liked it. You know, I think eight years is right. You know, seven years, fine. Uh, you can make it happen in seven years. But some of those undergraduate years where you really develop your personality and you develop your ability to talk to one another comes through. You know, when I went to residency, and no offense to anyone who's in a six-year medical program or pursuing one, when I went into residency and you had the six-year med program kids, you knew who they were because they did undergrad in two years and then went straight to medical school and their ability to kind of be empathetic with the patient, you didn't really have that. And I think getting that maturity is very, very important in medicine. Being able to talk to patients and talk to patients' family members is very important. Not to say that you can't catch up in the long term, uh, but I think seven years is a good sweet spot. Eight years, the BSMD, if you can get in uh, straight from um, high school, I mean, yeah, get it. Don't worry about the MCAT. Don't worry about having you know, you can have tension free for the first couple of years. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you everybody for asking such wonderful questions and thank you Dr. Singh for your time. We'll also be releasing a thank you form. So if you guys would like to show your gratitude for Dr. Singh for coming today to speak to us for our shadowing portion, you are more than welcome to fill that out. Meher, who is our executive director, she'll be sending out a message after the session is done. So you guys can fill that out there. But for right now, we will conclude our shadowing session. So thank you once again, Dr. Singh, for your valuable time. And we hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you, Davina. Thank you, Mayor. And if you know, if people have questions going forward, uh, you know, you guys have my email address. Uh, drop me a line, shoot me a question, anything you want. Um, if you go to my website, there's good resources for you uh, for exercises and I have a newsletter that I put out. So please try to feel free to subscribe to that and listen to the podcast. I think it'll be very, in, very informative. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. We will also be linking his social media so you don't have to go digging for it. We'll make sure that you guys all have it handy. That's wonderful. So without further ado, our next workshop will be our CPR interactive. So if you would like to go grab your pillow and, your, and or an American Girl doll, if you have one, it would be great if you can. But again, we're going to give you guys some time to go grab it so you can hang tight for a little bit. All right. So I'll start showing my screen. And these slides will also be posted on our Slack and our Google Drive afterwards. So you don't have to worry about furiously writing everything down because it will be provided to you. So. We would like to officially welcome you now to Medicine Power's unique first workshop. So you just heard from Dr. Singh and we will be having future workshops where we have a guest speaker first, and then it's followed by someone here at Medstem Power leading a workshop. And today our workshop is on CPR. I'm just gonna skip past these couple slides because we've already, we've already had our shadowing. You know who Dr. Singh is and we'll be providing his contact information. So Without further ado, here's our cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR workshop. And just keep in mind that this is not Red Cross certified, although we do pull the majority of our information from the American and Canadian Red Cross associations, as well as the American Heart Association. While it is not certified, it definitely will help you if you do wanna get certified in the future. And I'll also be keeping an eye on, on the chat. So if you guys have any questions at any point or if something is wrong or my audio isn't working, just feel free to shoot me a quick message and I will try to get that fixed as soon as possible. All right, so first off, what actually is CPR? So CPR is also known as cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's something that can help save a life during a cardiac or breathing emergency. It is performed when the patient's heart stops beating. And like we said earlier, it should only be performed in the case of an emergency. So just some quick stats as to why cardiac arrest and CPR are so important and critical, especially in today's society. So in the U.S., where a lot of you guys are based from, 
oh, almost half a million people die a year from cardiac arrest. In Canada, it's about 45,000 deaths per year. And globally, cardiac arrest claims more lives than colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, influenza, pneumonia, things that you guys have all heard of before. So that's why it's very important. And we want to make sure that throughout our program, we're teaching you guys some valuable skills that you can apply to your real life should you ever need it. All right, so the first thing that we wanted to do was kind of differentiate between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack because those terms are not interchangeable, but sometimes it can be easy, easy for us to think, oh, well, cardiac arrest and heart attack don't they mean the same thing. And lucky for you, you're here today, so you'll be able to find out that they actually don't mean the same thing. So first off, cardiac, what does cardiac mean? For all my medical terminology people out there, or just anyone that knows what cardiac means, I'll ask you guys and then we'll keep going. So if you guys know what it is, you can say it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. And don't worry, if you guys don't know, I won't leave you hanging. I'll just wait five seconds and we'll move on. Perfect, yeah. Pertaining to or related to the heart. Exactly, that's what cardiac means. Now, how about arrest? And we don't mean the arrest that is associated with the justice system. Apologies if you can hear the thunder. This is this New England weather right now and it's raining a lot, but Back to what arrest means. So what does arrest mean in medical terminology? Exactly, stopping or pausing or the cessation of something. So stop checking and refraining, which is why cardiac arrest means the cessation of cardiac activity, basically meaning that the heart stops, which results in the absence of circulating blood flow. Now, why is blood flow to your organs so important? What is your blood carrying that all of your organs need no matter what their function or purpose is? Yeah, I love it. You guys are really on the game today. Yeah, it's oxygen, seeing a ton, a ton of oxygen in the chat. Exactly. All of your organs, no matter what their purpose is, need oxygen. All right, now let's kind of differentiate this between a heart attack. So does anybody know what myocardial means? And this one's a bit trickier. So I'll give you guys a second. Yeah, some of you guys are really getting it, heart muscle, exactly. So it's pertaining to the myocardium, which is the layer of muscle tissue surrounding the heart. Um, all right, and what does infarction mean? This one also is a little bit trickier. Yep, some of you guys are getting it. Yep, exactly. It is kind of referring to the formation of an area of tissue death or just an area of tissue death in general. So a heart attack is what happens when one of the arteries that supply your heart or your myocardium become blocked, which causes damage or death of the heart tissue. So in patients that have suffered a heart attack, is their heart still beating? You guys can answer in the chat. Oops, sorry. So yes, you guys are correct. Their heart is not beating. Actually, no, 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 sorry, I actually take that back. Their heart is still beating, which is why we cannot perform CPR. I'm actually glad a lot of you guys are saying no, because this is something that's very important that we need to cover. So is the heart still beating in a patient that has suffered a heart attack? Yes, but it is abnormal and it is not fast enough and it's not safe enough for the patient to deliver enough oxygen to their body. So the correct answer to this is yes, which is why we can't perform CPR because CPR should only be performed when the heart stops beating. So again, I answered my own second question. Do we perform CPR or AED? The answer is no, we do not. And this is just a quick graphic that we've pulled from the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation, which is a nonprofit that is dedicated to differentiating between cardiac arrest and heart attack and promoting that kind of information to the general public. So you guys can save this, take a screenshot if you find that it's helpful. And these are just some major differences between someone that is a sudden cardiac, cardiac arrest victim or someone that's a heart attack victim. Again, you can see here that someone that is that has a, had a heart attack does not need CPR because they're breathing and their heart is beating, but someone that has suffered a sudden, a sudden cardiac arrest their heart is not beating, their heart has stopped, they're not breathing. All right, so now we kind of want to talk about why CPR? Why do we even want to perform CPR? What is so beneficial about it and how is it going to help us? So immediate CPR can double or triple your chances of survival after cardiac arrest, which is huge because there are very few medical procedures that we as civilians can perform that will actually make a difference without formal medical training besides getting certified by the Red Cross. It also aids in keeping blood flow active. You guys know that blood flow, oxygen, 
very vital to our organs. It also extends the opportunity for successful resuscitation once trained medical staff kind of arrive on site. And it's also part of one of the six links in the adult out of chain hospital chain of survival, which we'll also be going over a little bit later. So why CPR again? The first few minutes after a patient goes into cardiac arrest are the most important. You're trying to make sure that their organs are getting as much oxygen as possible. That's why we perform CPR because it pushes the remaining oxygen through the body to keep the organs alive. Because when the, when the organs are receiving oxygen, it doesn't prompt any, uh, any tissue or cell death. So this is the chain of survival I was talking about a little bit earlier. So the beautiful thing about CPR is that we as civilians can be responsible we can uh, be involved with two out of these six steps, which is great because we aren't trained medical professionals. So the first thing is to recognize that someone is undergoing a cardiac arrest and you activate the emergency response. Activating an emergency response for me, because I live in the United States, means to call 911. And we've also linked a document here and you guys can see this in the slides later on. But when you click that, you can see all the emergency numbers listed by country, by state, if you guys live in the US. And so if you don't exactly know what your emergency number is, just check that out because it's always helpful to have in case of an emergency. And then the second step, which is also something you guys can be um, involved with, is early CPR with an emphasis on chest compressions. The last couple steps, rapid defibrillation, advanced resuscitation by emergency medical services, post-cardiac arrest care, recovery, that's not stuff that we can be involved with, but arguably the first two steps are the most important, so you guys can pat yourself on the back. So who can actually perform CPR? So healthcare providers and people that have been trained to perform CPR can perform conventional CPR, chest compressions, mouth to mouth with a compression to breath rate of 30 to two, and the compression rate is about 100 to 120 compressions a minute. But the general public and bystanders can also perform CPR just without the rescue breaths. So you can perform compression only CPR, which is also known as hands only CPR. So something that we also wanted to cover was the before giving CPR, during and after, because we tend to really hyperfixate on compressions and compressions and are we doing the compressions correctly, but the before steps are just as important. So obviously the first step, notice that an adult or teenager or child has passed out, seems to be in need of medical attention. Your first step is not to check the injured person. Your first step, and this may seem shocking, is actually to check the scene to make sure it's safe for you to approach the injured person. If the scene isn't safe, if you're in the middle of a weather emergency, there's a hurricane, or it's just not safe for you, you cannot, follow, you cannot perform CPR. You have to uh, rest of the, um, the rest of the steps are kind of negated. So make sure the, sh the scene is safe and then you can move on. Your next step is to tap the person on the shoulder and shout really loudly, are you okay? We're assuming that because they are a victim of cardiac arrest, they will not move, they will not respond. Then your next step is to call 911 for assistance, tell them where you are, tell them that you see a victim that potentially is in cardiac arrest or is not responding to you. And then if you don't have an AED device available, then you can begin assisting. All right, so before you actually start your chest compressions, you first have to ensure that your patient or the, 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 um, the person that has undergone a cardiac arrest is lying on their back on a flat, hard surface i.e. pavement, grass, the ground. Do not try to perform CPR in water because I just don't do it because your compressions would just be pushing the person into the water and it also does not make a whole lot of sense. So make sure that the patient is lying with on their back on a hard surface. And you also wanna make sure that you tilt their head back slightly to lift their chin. That's opening up their airway. So you tilt their head back and you also lift their chin to make sure that their airway is open. Then your next thing is to check for breathing sounds. Do not, I repeat, please do not try to look for breathing sounds to see if their chest is rising and falling. You can't look, you have to listen. So you put your ear over their mouth and nose to see if you can hear breathing sounds and you only check for 10 seconds. After 10 seconds has passed and you're like, I'm not sure if I can hear them, you assume it's no and you move on. A good breathing rate is about 10, uh, 12 to 20 breaths a minute. Your next step is to check for a pulse. So can anyone tell me where you can find your carotid pulse? Yes, exactly. You can take two fingers. For me, it's on my left side. For you looking at me, it looks like it's on my right. You can take two fingers here and I can't feel it right now because I'm talking. But once you 
stop talking. You can feel your pulse there. You can move your fingers around a little bit. It's a good skill to know, um, to just kind of know how, where you can find your pulse, especially in your carotid, your radial, brachial. Those are good uh, life skills to have. And a normal pulse for an adult is 60 to 80 beats per minute. Obviously for children, it would be um, higher. And here's another question. So if you hear occasional gasping, does this mean that the patient is breathing and therefore does not need CPR? No, good job guys. No, we still need to give CPR. Occasional gasping could be an indicator that the person is choking on something and it's obstructing their airway. So that would prompt you to see if there's anything blocking their airway. So occasional gasping does not mean that you don't need CPR. Even if you hear that, kind of just push it to the back of your, back of your mind because you know that those aren't the 12 to 20 breaths a minute you're looking for and that you do need to still perform CPR. All right, so now if you have a pillow, or something that's kind of wide and fluffy, you can go grab it. Obviously we can't provide you guys with CPR mannequins because you live all over the world and this is a virtual program, but this is kind of the next best thing. So while I'm talking, you guys can kind of get up, maybe turn your cameras on or off and go grab a pillow. All right, so the first thing is to prep your pillow or an adult. So your pillow is representing the chest cavity of an adult. You should be, um, you should be holding it horizontally. You, you guys can kind of get up, maybe bring your computer with you to the, to the floor because you want to make sure it's on a hard surface. So either a table where you can stand up or the ground where you should be kneeling. Keep in mind that if you're performing compressions on the ground for a patient, you you should be kneeling. You shouldn't be standing up to try to perform those compressions. So you place the pillow on the ground. Again, the pillow is the chest cavity. Try to locate where the center of the patient's chest would be, where you would try to perform CPR if it were a human being, etc. Okay, now another question for you guys. What is something that we have in our human bodies that a pillow does not that could make performing CPR incredibly difficult? Yeah, good job, guys. Seeing this a lot in the chat, a rib cage. So another frequently asked question we get is, what about the ribs? What if I break a rib or I break the sternum when I'm trying to compress on an adult? And actually the answer is that's okay. You won't know the full extent of the damage that you potentially might be doing if you push down and you break a rib. That's very, very common when you're performing CPR. If you see someone performing CPR on a TV show, it looks kind of simple, really. It doesn't even look like the person sometimes has a rib cage. It looks exactly like performing it on a dummy but the rib cage will make it incredibly difficult for you to push down. So it's okay if you feel a rib cracking, the American Heart Association and the Red Cross actually tell you to keep going to keep um, performing your compressions, which is something that we thought was interesting and worth noting. So your very first step is to kneel behind the person or pillow if you've got one and to place the heel of one hand on the center of the chest and the heel of the other hand on top of your first hand. So I'm gonna show you guys. I'm right-handed, this is my right hand, this is my left hand. You want your dominant hand to be on top. So if this is my left hand, I'm gonna take my right hand and kind of lace my fingers through and clamp it like this. So that's how my hands are gonna be on the patient's chest. So let's say I'm left-handed, so this is my left hand, this is my right hand, my right hand's gonna be on the bottom, my left hand is gonna go through, clamp, and that's how it's gonna be on the patient's chest. So that's your very first step, get your hands ready. Then your second step is to position your body so that your shoulders are directly over your arms. You don't wanna be performing CPR while your arms are bent like mine are right now. Your hands should be completely straight. That way your body weight can kind of be thrown into the compressions and you know, help you try to get to the compression rate and the compression depth that you need to be successful. So the third step, Kind of simple, push hard, push fast. You use your body weight to kind of help administer the compressions that are at least two inches deep for adults in the chest cavity, two compressions a second at least. You want 100 to 120 compressions a minute. This is something that is also very important. Please be sure to let the chest or your pillow rise fully in between compressions. Don't push down so hard that you're not giving the patient's chest enough time to rise back up. That defeats the purpose of CPR. All right, so now we're gonna let you guys kind of try it out. So go grab a timer, set your pillow up on the floor, get your hands all ready, lock them up, set a timer for a minute and see if you can do 100 or 120 compressions. So I'm gonna keep my chat open right now in case you guys have any questions about how you're doing this, but we're gonna give you guys one or two minutes to kind of practice CPR on your pillow dummy.
Staying Alive is a good song. Just right in the chat. Yeah, the doctors on Grey's Anatomy don't do a very good um, job at the compressions. It's not very medically accurate. If you guys have any questions about like camp positioning or how we're actually supposed to be compressing, just let me know. We'll give you guys about another minute and then we'll move on. Yes, we are gonna do the one for an infant. That's why we had you guys bring some dolls. Um, how fast or slow do we go? So we, that's the kind of the purpose of setting up a, a stopwatch rather. So if you guys can just pull out your phone, set up a stopwatch. And as you see the seconds passing, you should know that for each second that passes, you should be doing two compressions that are about two, um, two centimeters or two inches deep. How hard should we push down? It doesn't matter how hard you're pushing as long as you're getting down to the two inches within the one or two seconds. I can see a lot of you guys doing it right now. Awesome job. Yeah, there you guys go. Love it. We apologize for the false information being promoted in our chat right now. Ahmad's saying that Owen is better than Derek. So we do apologize sincerely for that. You can just uh, skip over that. I'm joking, but I think we have a question. Someone has raised their hands. Erin, would you like to ask? Yeah, I was just curious about the dangers of performing CPR if you're not properly trained or you're not aware of what you're doing. Yeah, so this is also a question that we do get a lot. What if I'm performing CPR and I don't know how to perform CPR? What if I puncture the lung? First off, fun fact, there is a law that protects you. It's called the Good Samaritan Law. Keep that in your mind for later, hint, hint. But this law does protect you from anyone trying to sue you saying, well, you perform CPR, but you didn't really know how to do it. The law protects you because the lawmakers and the legal people involved in this know that you are trying your best to save somebody's life. And that's why we're perform That's why we're um, teaching you guys workshops on this right now. So that way, even if 10 years from now, the only thing you remember is that you need 100 or 120 compressions a minute and something about clamping your hands, that is miles and miles more helpful than not knowing anything at all. So the smallest thing that you do know about CPR will help. And of course, even if the only thing you do is call 911, you've already activated the first step in a six chain link of out of hospital survival. So really you should be all set to go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Great question. Soha, you got a question? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know like what the process for getting a CPR certificate would be like in Canada, if that's something you are knowledgeable about. Do you mind sharing that? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of Canadian universities, I attended Canadian University as well. So some universities actually offer a certification course through their um, emergency team club or organization. But another safe thing to do would be to get a certification online. You can actually get American certification online. They offer classes that are fully virtual. You don't have to go to a place in person. I do think that is less beneficial than going there and actually trying CPR, but it definitely is better than nothing. So if you guys want, we can link some resources to getting your certification in the chat later on or in our resources that we upload. Yeah, that would actually be like really helpful if you could put some links. Thank yeah, you so course. much. For sure. Iris, you have a question? Um, yes, please. Um, could you go over again, like, uh, did you say to, like, when you were talking about putting your shoulders over your hands, are you, like, directing your weight, like, straight down, or, like, what is the, okay. Yeah, you're kind of directing your weight straight down. I can't stand up right now because I'm docking, but you you would imagine that the patient, patient's chest is right at the end of your hands. Your shoulders are locked and your full body weight is kind of in your shoulders and your upper back going into the compressions that you're making. That makes okay. sense. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to move on. You guys can feel free to keep trying out your compression, set your timer, see if you are doing it right. The only way to know if you are performing CPR correctly is to try it. So that is great. And I really love that you guys have been trying it out. I've been watching you guys trying some of the compressions out and you are all doing an amazing job. All right. So now how is CPR different between adults and now children. So these are the major differences. So for children, you only perform CPR for two minutes. So let's say you're an, there's an adult that is in need of cardiac arrest care. 
you can perform it for as long as you need to until emergency services arrive. But for children, you stop at two minutes. Even if the child isn't breathing after the two minutes are up, you do, you, it is recommended that you stop. And this picture is actually inaccurate because you should only use one hand instead of two while you're compressing. So for children, you use one hand instead of the two lock that we have. So your one hand, you stretch and lock it, and that's how you can use the compressions because children and infants are much more fragile than adults are. And for children, you are allowed to deliver two rescue breaths. So you just pinch their nose shut and you place your mouth over their mouth and you breathe into it, hoping that their chest will rise. That's the point of it. All right, and now for infants. So this is where you guys can go grab a doll. Maybe if you have younger siblings and they have dolls, those dolls are lying around somewhere around the house. Or if you are like some of us that grew up in the US and kind of grew up obsessed with American Girl dolls, you can go grab one of those if you still got it. But of course for infants, rather than shouting, are you okay? Please don't shout that at an infant, like just don't. Um, infants normally do have periodic breathing, so changes in breathing pattern are normal. And again, rather than shouting, are you okay, just tap their foot to see if you can elicit a response. And we're assuming that because the infant is in cardiac arrest, you're not going to get a response. So for infants, instead of pinching their nose and delivering a rescue breath mouth to mouth, you actually make a complete seal over their nose and their mouth with your mouth because adult, the face of an adult is much bigger than the face of an infant. So that's what you can do for your rescue breaths. But for the compression, you use two fingers. Most people end up using their second and their third fingers to, to deliver um, 30 quick compressions. And as opposed to adults, it's 1.5 inches deep, not two. You guys can try measuring it out too. Honestly, when you're compressing, don't hold a ruler up next to you and kind of do that. Um, it's, it's really just eyeballing it, but just know that when you're performing CPR on an infant, you should be pushing down um, about a half inch less than you would be for an adult. So now we're going to give you guys a minute or two to go grab a doll if you've got one and kind of try out the compressions on your own. So again, two fingers, 30 compressions, 1.5 inches deep, and I'll be looking at my chat to see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, the image of shouting, are you okay at an infant is just, <laughs> it's not, it's not the best, so just don't do it. Um, do you only do the breaths if the chest is not rising, or is it something you do after a certain time? So af I'm assuming you're talking about the children or the adults. So after, for infants, after you do the 30 compressions, then you do two breaths. Same for children, 30 compressions with one hand, two breaths. Is there a song that goes to infant compressions? Unfortunately, not that we know of, but if you guys wanna make a song that goes to it, we're all for that. How many compressions breaths for infants? So 15, uh, no, not 15, pardon. I'm gonna go back so you guys can see it. 30 quick compressions that are 1.5 inches deep and use two fingers for infants. Again, for children, hands, adults, two hands, but infants, two fingers. All right, so we're gonna give you guys like another 30 seconds and then we're gonna move on. If you guys wanna ask a question by raising your hand too, that's totally okay. I think someone had their hand raised, but I was looking at the chat. Is it safe to do CPR if the person is bleeding due to a severe accident? That's a great question. It depends on where they are bleeding. If it's an external extremity bleed, for example, their foot, that's fine. Again, doing CPR is just to push the remaining oxygen throughout the blood. So it is okay to perform CPR, but just be careful because if you know that there is severe bleeding right out of their heart, then obviously you don't perform CPR there. It is situational. So it's just something that depends on, like I said, the situation. All right, so we're gonna move on. So again, this is just a recap. You guys can take a quick picture of this, take a screenshot or anything if it is helpful. Again, even if, like we said earlier, even if 10 years from now, the only thing you remember is that you're doing 30 compressions at 100 to 120 compressions a minute, that is incredibly helpful and could be life-saving. So you are all set.
All right, and we'd like to end by saying that no matter the time, it is a beautiful day to save lives, and we hope that all this information has been helpful for you in terms of our CPR workshop and the guest speaker, as well as anything else that we've been sharing here today. So now what we'll be doing is based on the knowledge that you guys have just learned we're going to be playing a kahoot so if you guys want to grab a phone or you guys want to open up a tab on your workshop uh, i mean not in your workshop your laptop if you guys want to open up a tab we'll be sharing the code there shortly and you guys can kind of play with the questions that we have done so far All right, so I will be pulling up the Kahoot momentarily, and I'll also link it in the chats. You guys can hear the fun music. Yeah, and the homework will be linked. We'll, Meher is gonna send out a message in Slack after the session is done. So you guys can um, just complete the homework quickly there. Yeah, so many names, honestly. Yeah, sure, we can send you guys a link for our Slack when we're done. Ahmad or Meher, would you guys mind linking our Slack in the chat? This homework is due before our next session. So our next session is this Thursday, same time, different place because it's uh, it's a different Zoom link, but we will see you guys all here this Thursday at five o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, the Kahoot music really changed in the past couple of years. Don't know how to feel about that. Yep, you guys are all good. All right, I'm gonna get started. And if you guys join a little bit late, that's okay. We will still give you guys the opportunity. It's not gonna close as soon as you, as soon as we hit start. Hi, I just have a question before we start. Sure. Uh, the research symposium thing hasn't been like released yet, right? Like uh, the PDF and you said that there will be more information given, but that's due, I think tomorrow. Yep, exactly. The information will all be posted by tomorrow. It's all completed and we've also talked to our international kids about it today, but you guys will all be finding out about the research symposium by tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It'll be in both of your program specific Google drives. There's a folder called research symposium. That's where you can find it. All right, we're gonna get started. And yes, the session is also on YouTube. We'll be linking that there as well. All right, so in CPR, adult compressions must be at least how many inches deep? Yeah, good job, everybody. It should be at least two inches deep. Nice job, Clara. All right, when arriving at the scene of an injury, the very first thing you must do is, it's not the most obvious one. What we just talked about earlier. Exactly, check the scene for safety. You do not check the injured person first. You have to make sure that the scene is safe for you to approach. Good job, guys. All right, when performing CPR, where should you pick, place your hands on the patient's chest? Yep, 
Yes, on the center of the sternum. The sternum is the flat bone on your chest. That's exactly where you should start compression. So you guys can feel it. It's just a hard flat bone right in the center where some of your major ribs protrude off of. All right, so after you check the scene for safety, so you know it's safe, what's your next step? Job. Nice job, everybody. So what's a normal pulse, pulse rate for an adult? Yep, 60 to 80 to 80. All right, a normal respiratory rate or breathing rate for an adult. Yeah, so not, oh, sorry, but there's a mistake here. It's not one to three breaths per minute. It should be 10 to 15 breaths per minute. 24 to 30 is too high. Generally, the ideal range is between 12 and 20. Apologies about that. All right, so to open someone's airway, what would you do first or with what technique? Exactly. Tilt their head up and lift their chin. Good job, everybody. Almost, we're over halfway done. So the rate of breaths to, um, to compressions to breaths. Exactly, yeah, 30 to two. So 30 compressions for two breaths. Good job, everybody. In first place, we have Dot. So if a person is unconscious, you can treat them through what kind of consent? This is important. Implied consent, exactly. You can't get verbal or written consent because the person is unconscious, so it's implied. What's the law that protects you when you're providing first aid and CPR? We talked about this one earlier too. Good job, everybody. It's the Good Samaritan Law. All right, in your primary assessment of the CPR patient, what are you looking for? Good job, yeah, checking for breathing and determining their level of consciousness. 
So breathing sounds, heart rate, those are all good indicators of consciousness. All right, so you've checked the patient, you determine that they're unconscious. What do you got to do next? Yes, good job, everybody. Call 911 and grab an AED if you can find one. All right, only a couple more questions. So in look, listen, and feel, what are you hearing or feeling kind of? Up, everybody you are hearing for breathing sounds again take your ear place it over their mouth and, and nose to see if you can hear them breathing it's not something we look for all right all right so we're carrying out CPR first thing you do to ensure the airway is open is Good job, everybody. Properly position the head. Last question. All right, what two major sites are commonly used to take a pulse? We talked about one of them and I had you guys try to find it. Second one we didn't talk about. <laughs> yeah good job everybody carotid and radial so where's your radial pulse we know the carotids the carotid artery which is in your upper neck yeah wrist good job everybody and what is the one finger you should never use to try to take a pulse and why thumb exactly why do we not use our thumb yeah because the thumb has its own pulse fun fact so it would throw you off when trying to see if someone else has a pulse because you might think that they do when in fact they don't because it's your thumb. Fun facts. All right, let's see how you guys did. My goodness. <laughs> We don't even know who uh, is in first place, but congratulations to Dot, Aishi, and Meita. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, but congratulations, everybody. All right. So with that, we are going to finally conclude our very first session of the National Future and Decent STEM summer program. Thank you guys so much for attending. We really hope that it was a wonderful experience for you. And if you ever have any feedback for us, you can scroll through our, our program itinerary. There's a feedback form that we're gonna be checking every day of the program. So if there's any ever anything that we can do to make your program experience here any better, we would love to make sure that we can make that happen. You can keep it anonymous, but if you would prefer that we reach back out to you, then leave your name there but just make sure that you finish the Google form homework assignment, which we're gonna be linking in a message. Meher, who's our executive director, like we said earlier, she's gonna be linking that. And we will see you guys here Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. But thank you all so much for coming. It was wonderful to see you and we will see you again very soon. We'll stick around if you guys have any questions, but for right now, have a wonderful rest of your night. And we're going to stop recording now.